Uh, all right, so uh, thank you all for coming to our talk today. Uh, today's talk is focus on models, not infrastructure. Uh, how to accelerate model training with an easy to use, high performance distributed AI ML stack uh, for the cloud. And just to kick things off here, my name is Michael Clifford. Uh, I'm a data scientist in Red Hat's office of the CTO on the emerging technologies team. And my current focus is on developing tools in like the ML ops space for training, serving, and monitoring large scale or like foundation models. Uh, so if you have any questions or want to connect with me after the talk, uh, you can reach me at email or, or on GitHub is, is preferable. Uh, Eric will introduce himself. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Eric Erlinson, and I am the uh, team lead of the uh, data science team at Emerging Technologies. And uh, our team uh, basically explores you know, workloads and tooling and uh, design patterns at the intersection of data science um, and the cloud, for, for instance, Kubernetes. Thanks. All right. So. Today, we're going to talk about kind of what I see as a, an ideal workflow for data scientists who are looking to make use of uh, distributed compute resources in the cloud. Like, what are the set of open source tools that we need to use to construct this workflow, uh, specifically talking about things like Ray, Open Data Hub, uh, Project Codeflare. Uh, and then we'll go into a live demo showing you how you could use these tools yourself. And then finally, we'll have a, a Q&A at the end. Okay, great, so <laughs> with the agenda out of the way, let's just get started. So this talk is about how we think we can make distributed machine learning in the cloud like significant, significantly easier. And why would we wanna do that, you might ask yourself. Like, isn't it already easy? Um, but, or like, hasn't the domain of high performance computing already solved this problem? And in my experience, like, it hasn't really. And particularly when we're talking about like the Kubernetes or OpenShift landscape. Uh, and I could be wrong about this, um, but I think this is largely due to the fact that like the Kubernetes ecosystem didn't really have high performance workloads baked into its core DNA at, at the onset. So it's not really like a perfect fit out of the box for machine learning workloads. Uh, that said, right, there's obviously been tons of work in the last few years to enable these types of workloads from organizations all over. And it's really becoming the, the default platform for developing, training, and serving these machine learning models as they like, only continue to grow bigger and bigger. Um, <clears throat> but how would you actually do this today, right? Like, how could I, a lowly data scientist, set up my working environment to take advantage of all of these, like, new features. So like as a data scientist, I think it's pretty difficult, right? You'd basically have to become a part-time DevOps person. You'd need to learn about managing an OpenShift cluster, how to install like specific operators that enable things like GPU av availability, what custom resource definitions are um, for different distributed compute frameworks. You'd need to learn how to write YAML file files to deploy your workloads. So. The point is, like, it's certainly possible today to do this stuff, but it's a little bit of a pain. Um, and it's a pretty big shift for the average data scientist to learn all of this just so they can, like, train their models effectively. Um, so what I'd like to think is our kind of contribution to this space, and um, what we're gonna talk about today, or for the rest of our talk here, is the, a project that hopefully makes some of the awesome tools that exist today uh, more readily available to the average data scientist. Uh, so just given that setup, right, what might an ideal workflow look like? Well, it might look something like this graph here. Uh, we have a team of data scientists who are working in uh, different development environments, but with access to a pool of shared resources. Uh, some users might be in the cloud already using something like Open Data Hub, which Eric will talk about uh, in a minute. Others might be on their laptops or, or, or whatever. The point is they're on some like lower footprint resource constrained environment. Uh, and even if that's a pretty like beefy desktop with multiple GPUs, it's still not really like the caliber of infrastructure we generally need for large scale models. Um, 
So this is where data scientists kind of live, though. This is where they want to and should be doing maybe 90% of their, their work, their prototyping, their experimental uh, work. But once it's time to kick off like a real training job, um, their resource requirements essentially like skyrocket. And this is when they need to rely on the elasticity and the power of the cloud to, to do their work. So it'd be great if instead of knowing like anything about the DevOps stuff that I mentioned before, um, they could just like have a simple Python interface to define some, some basic resource requirements that they need for their distributed training job, submit it, and then like let the cloud do, do its magic, right? So queuing the workloads is a single job that needs to be gang scheduled, uh, scaling up any additional resources if necessary, uh, then running the workloads such that the users can, can monitor their, their jobs. So this is what we're kind of trying to achieve. And we want to construct some stack of tools, mostly open, primarily open source tools, that will enable our team of data scientists, uh, data science users, to like abstract away any real uh, infrastructure concerns. And this is where Project Codeflare enters the picture. Um, so Project Codeflare was originally started inside of IBM Research with the goal of kind of simplifying the processes and infrastructure management around the training of, of large-scale models like LLMs and other foundation tier models um, by like abstracting away a lot of the specific infrastructure concerns. And over the past year, uh, it has become a joint initiative between Red Hat and IBM Research, and it's currently a, a fully open source uh, project. I, I really encourage all of you to go to the Project Codeflare project page um, on GitHub and, and check it out. Um, but today, we're not going to talk too much more about Project Codeflare as a whole, um, but we will talk about like uh, kind of a subunit of it, which is the Codeflare stack, which is a set of projects we use kind of in concert with each other to enable this distributed compute work we're trying to achieve. Uh, so we'll also talk about the Codeflare SDK, which is a Python interface for the Codeflare stack, and the Codeflare operator for installing and managing all of the, the Codeflare resources. Um, but just as a kind of caveat, they're all sub-projects of Project Codeflare itself. Um, and the current like stack that, that we care about, um, as I just mentioned, it includes the Codeflare SDK, uh, the Codeflare operator for managing MCAD, which is a multi-cluster app dispatcher, um, as well as InstaScale. Uh, it also includes like uh, Ray, Kubre, and PyTorch, and it's designed to work like seamlessly as part of the Open Data Hub ecosystem, which is something Eric will discuss here in a minute. Cool. So here is a, a, a brief diagram that shows kind of how each component of the stack interacts with each other. So fairly similar to like the ideal workflow. Uh, I showed earlier, we have a team of data scientists that are able to use the Codeflare SDK to send requests for the creation of distributed compute clusters to MCAD uh, in a shared resource environment. MCAD is then able to aggregate the requests from all the users and queues the workloads appropriately. Once the resources are available, uh, it handles dispatching all, all of the jobs into, into the cluster. Uh, we also have InstaScale, which is there to kind of like dynamically scale up and down your cluster size uh, if it doesn't have the, the required resources uh, right away. And the SDK users can like retrieve information about their running compute clusters and send requests back to MCAD to, to shut them down. Um, so yeah, so that's just like the whole stack there to show you about the, the interaction between the different, the different pieces. Um, but today we're going to talk, we're not gonna talk about the entire Codeflare stack here, uh, but just really those pieces that we think are kind of like the most relevant and interesting to our data science users uh, and how it can integrate with the Open Data Hub project. Um, uh, yeah, so that's really gonna be the, the elements of the stack, which are the SDK, Ray, and Kubre, and also uh, Open Data Hub. Uh, cool, so let me hand it over to 
Eric, and he can tell you about some of the more like technical details of Ray and Open Data Hub. Thanks, Michael. So, I don't know, show of hands, how many here have worked with Ray in some capacity? Oh, okay, only one. Good. These slides are not wasted on you. Um, so, if you imagine like the spectrum of um, distributed computing tooling, you can imagine like on the far left, something like you know, MPI, which you know, in, in its niche occupies you know, the space where you're doing a lot of control, again, extremely detailed control over what you do, but you have very low level abstractions. And so it takes some expertise to use. Um, there's more ways that you might use it wrong. Um, then on the far right, you have a, a tool such as like Apache Spark. Um, now Apache Spark, you know, doesn't allow you to do all the things that are possible with a low level tool like um, MPI, however, um, it has much higher level and potentially more powerful abstractions. Um, so let's talk about Ray. Ray basically occupies a, a niche sort of between them, but definitely closer to Spark. It's a higher level um, abstraction layer, but it does actually allow you to uh, encode um, computations, uh, more, more kinds of computation than, than Spark does. Um, so Ray's programming model is actually rather nice too. Um, if you imagine, um, you know, functions um, and classes in Python, um, you can basically use Ray decorators. In fact, the same Ray decorator in both. If you apply Ray dot remote to a function, you get a task, which basically takes in some input, runs a computation, and returns some output. Um, if you apply it to a class, you get something that's a little bit more like a you know, microservice. It's a process that will run out on the Ray cluster, um, and you can like, you know, communicate with it. Um, and you can see it's a, just extremely easy to take your Python and um, make it Ray enabled with the decorators. Um, so as with Spark, um, computations in Ray are directed acyclic graphs. Um, they're slightly more general directed acyclic graphs. In this, uh, in this diagram here, um, we have like the world's most over-engineered um, summation of eight integers you might have, you may ever see. Um, you can see over on the right, we have defined a little function in Python called add. Um, and all it does is add two integers. Um, and now, if you can see, we've added the uh, dot remote call to it. That's the thing that you get by, um, you know, this uh, um, ray.remote. Uh, decorator. And so here we're building up uh, a summation of two, four pairs of numbers. Um, then we're like adding those sums up um, in a tree structure to get a final summation result. And you can have that sort of dependency graph on it. Um, so if you look at these, as with Spark, these are declarative computations. Um, if you, if you execute those, uh, those steps, nothing has happened yet. Um, however, if you uh, run, the, uh, run the git method, um, it initiates a lazy computation. And so this is kind of like you know, spark, spark actions. Um, you know, it says, oh, I've got to compute something. Um, and I'm going to unwind the entire directed acyclic graph and eventually get to my result. Um, so again, everybody's work with Spark. This basic idea should be pretty, pretty familiar. Um, so Ray's, Ray's underlying um, data store model is uh, called Plasma, and it used to be, um, it actually used to be in the Ray code base. However, Ray uh, donated it to uh, Apache Arrow, so now you can actually use Plasma independently of Ray. Um, it is a uh, typeless and schemaless, um, which as you might. See, it's like a little bit different than uh, Spark's columnar uh, data model, but it is very well suited to something that's typeless and schemaless like Python. Um, it uses a local first data model, so and basically it will only pull data from someplace remote if it's not already present. And so the cumulative effect of this is it can be very, very efficient. Um, it's only moving data around when it needs to. Um, its scheduling model is similar, it's local first, and so. Um, it always tries to run local copies of a scheduler on each worker node. 
and you know, so like scheduler, the global scheduler only has to do stuff when the local scheduler um, can't get its work done um, by itself. It comes with a lot of uh, very nice native libraries. Um, most recently, the uh, Ray AI runtime and uh, Ray Data, which is na native data frame. So with uh, Ray Data now, it has a layer of data model that's much closer to Apache Sparks. It's kind of like a columnar uh, data. Um, it has a lot of uh, distributed training wrappers, uh, hyperparameter tuning, um, an actual, it has a model serving mechanism, and one of its oldest uh, applications, uh, reinforcement learning. It's one of the earliest uh, success stories for Ray. So those are all native. Um, in addition, there are tons and tons of community integrations now. Um, <coughs> XGBoost, PyTorch, SKLearn, um, Alibi, which I think is quite nice. Um, you like to be able to interrogate your model functions. Um, Dask, Modin, um, basically anything in the data science ecosystem these days probably has a meaningful integration with Ray. Um, and so, of course, one thing that all these tools have in common is because they're also in the Python ecosystem, you can use them with something like a, a Jupyter notebook. Um, and this is nice because what it allows you to do is actually literate, um, iterative data science um, with Ray in Jupyter. And furthermore, um, you can host all of this uh, you know, in something like Kubernetes. Um, now, today, the actual demo you'll see is running on OpenShift, which, of course, is a particular flavor of Kubernetes. Um, but that's the one you're going to be seeing in action now. You can run it on regular Kube if you want to. Um, one thing that's nice is uh, Ray is really nicely architected for cloud-native architecture. Um, it has a Ray cluster custom resource. If you create one of these things, the Ray operator will notice it and spin you up your own little Ray cluster in the cloud, which, again, rather like Spark, has like a Ray head node and a bunch of worker nodes, which you can specify. Um, it natively does very nicely. The Ray operator will actually automatically scale workers up and down based on its perceived workload. Um, it does that pretty much out of the box. It works pretty well. And um, then once you have a cluster, you can attach to it with some kind of client um, and get some work done. And uh, in the work you're going to be seeing today, we're using Jupyter, but I deliberately said client because um, you know, it could be something like VS Code or any other code that you write. It, the client doesn't even have to be inside of the cluster. You can run like on your laptop attaching to uh, you know, the right head node from the outside. So you, there's a lot of workflows you can use here. Um, so Jupyter. Um, in our instance, is going to be coming from uh, Open Data Hub. And I'll talk a little bit about what, what that is. Um, it has a few different useful properties. The first thing about Open Data Hub is it's an open source downstream of Kubeflow. Um, so if you're familiar with Kubeflow, you have some familiarity with uh, ODH. Um, it serves kind of nicely as a reference platform. It's, uh, it sort of shows you how to like deploy different kinds of data science tooling in a cloud-native way um, using its own operator. So you can actually install this kind of tooling using the uh, ODH operator. Um, of course, you don't have to do that. Um, all these tools are federated. They're fairly loosely integrated. It makes it really easy to, if you want to swap out a tool that you like, or if you want to add a kind of tool that's not present, um, it's just a bunch of processes running on Kube, and so it's very easy, very easy to uh, to do that. Um, so, what is data science like with ODH? Um, I kind of like this two-axis diagram here. So, like on the horizontal axis, you have like actual you know workflow tasks, um, like everything from setting business goals to you know data prep, actually training the models. Um, act writing apps that use them and deploying the models themselves, and then once they're in deployment, monitoring. Um, then on the other axis, you have just data science personas, everything from business stakeholders, data engineering, the model jockeys, um, machine learning engineers that you know, can specialize in bridging the gap between data science and uh, you know, a tool like Kubernetes. 
um, and of course IT operations. Um, so you can see in the center here, the demo we're doing today kind of lives in the center here where classic data science, we're gonna do some distributed model training using Jupyter and Codeflare. Um, and I've mentioned how you know, federated it is, and in fact, the demo you'll be seeing today is an example of us, um, and by us I mostly mean Michael, creating a new integration um, of the uh, Codeflare tooling with ODH. And so this is actually a, literally a demonstration of the value of this federation. And with that, I will hand it back to Michael. All right, thanks, Eric. <clears throat> uh, yeah, cool. So. Now that we know a little bit more about what Ray is, uh, how Open Data Hub works, uh, we might want to return to the question of, like, how do I actually implement this? Um, like, how do I turn this into, a, uh, into my daily workflow? What, what, what would I actually do? Well, you can use the Codeflare SDK. It's a Python package that we've developed. You can pip install it from PyPI. It does assume that you have like the Codeflare operator uh, installed on your cluster, which again manages the MCAT and InstaScale we talked about earlier. Um, but after that, it should be a really, it should provide a really simple uh, interface for users to interactively uh, or programmatically define, deploy, and monitor their distributed workloads. Um, so today, the SDK currently focuses really on two kinds of objects. Uh, first, the framework cluster, or sorry, <laughs> two kinds of objects, the framework cluster and the batch job. So the framework cluster, in our case here, is going to be Ray, but you could imagine that there are other frameworks that you would be using for uh, code or for distributing your work. Uh, so again, we use the term framework cluster to differenti dif differentiate uh, that the worker pods, which are also called clusters from like the actual OpenShift cluster itself. Um, for the framework clusters, we can define and customize them however we want via a cluster config class. We can then instantiate it as a cluster object and call cluster.up uh, to deploy our resources to our, our, our OpenShift or, or Kubernetes cluster. So while the cluster is running, we can see details about our remote cluster using cluster.details, um, and then bring the whole thing down with cluster.down. Again, this can be used like either programmatically or, or interactively. Um, yeah, these functions allow you to programmatically and, and also reproducibly uh, configure and spin up uh, clusters of distributed workers for your machine learning jobs. And it also does this without you really needing to know that much about the, the underlying infrastructure. Uh, the second object that we care about is, is the batch job. So whereas the framework cluster is kind of like a more long running object that you could interact with while, while prototyping uh, or submit multiple jobs to, the job object is really like singular and actually defines the workload that will be run. <coughs> So for example, like the model training script um, and any specific requirements that it, it might have. Um, so again, like the, the framework cluster, we can define our job parameters and then submit it to be run on a specific cluster, just using like uh, submit to cluster. Um, and we can see the job logs and statuses as it's running. And we can also cancel uh, the job if we need it to. Um, so again, this is like invoking a bit of that uh, OpenShift infrastructure management behind the scenes. Um, but hopefully for the data science user, it's like as simple as these few Python commands and they won't really have to worry about OpenShift dashboards or um, kubectl commands or, or anything like that. Uh, cool, so yeah, these, those are the parts of the stack that we wanted to highlight today. Um, so just as a quick recap, We've got our ideal workflows, our ideal workflow up here from the start. It has a few extra uh, annotations indicating the actual workflow that we've currently developed as part of the, the Codeflare stack. So we have the, the SDK for the developers to define, uh, deploy, and monitor their distributed workloads. We have the Codeflare operator for MCAT and InstaScale uh, that manages the infrastructure and resource allocation for us. 
um, and we have Ray that's actually performing the kind of distributed computation on our cluster. And in our particular case, uh, this is all kind of wrapped up in the Open Data Hub project um, and an extended feature that brings distributed workloads and batch computing to that particular end-to-end uh, -end cloud native data science platform. Cool. Uh, so now I'm going to give you all a demo. Uh, hopefully it, it, it works well. Um, there are a couple of prereqs that I just wanted to be transparent about, so have this demo actually uh, work for everyone if they're trying to follow along. Um, so you'll need to have an OpenShift cluster. Uh, you'll need to install the Open Data Hub operator and the CodeFlare operator. Uh, both of them are already on Operator Hub, so it can all be done like pointing and clicking. It's, it's not difficult at all. Um, and you also need to initialize a particular instance of Open Data Hub with a, a KF def to enable the CodeFlare stack, but that's really it. Um, if you're interested in doing it yourself, this quickstart.md at Open Data Hub distributed workloads, quick start, um, has some more specific instructions for you, but that's, a, that's about the extent of it. All right, cool. So let me start here with a demo. Oop. Shit, what just happened? Okay, good. <laughs> uh, external only, I don't want that. Switch the screens here. It's uh, the worst possible option. Uh, give me a second here. Hold on. How did this get? All right, cool. Uh, great, so now I am a data science user using Open Data Hub, and I want to get started with using the, the CodeFlare stack that we've talked about. So I can go ahead and launch my Jupyter Notebook environment. Um, I already have a server up and running just because pulling images and stuff can take some time and you all don't want to see that. Um, but the point is I have a notebook image currently running in my like shared cluster with my team of data scientists. Um, I'm using a CodeFlare notebook image, which is an image that's maintained by uh, the project that has all of the requirements that you would need to run this all out of the box. Another thing to note is that the deployment size of my actual working environment is gonna be small. Um, I'm really using like one CPU and four gigabytes of memory, and I'm also using like no GPUs. So that's to say like the actual development like driver environment that I'm working from doesn't need to really have any resources um, at all to interact with this, uh, this stack. So let me access my notebook server here. Sign in. This doesn't require me to sign in again. Uh, cool, so now I'm in my Jupyter Hub environment. Is this like familiar to most people here? Is this not look? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so Jupyter Hub uh, or Jupyter Lab is a, just a classic working environment for data scientists. Um, let's see, I'll just see, let's see who am I? <laughs> okay, walks me out of the server. So I need to just quickly log myself back in. Uh, forgive me here while I hide my screen. Um, okay, hold on. <laughs> I 
did this like five times this morning to make sure it wouldn't happen right now, but it always does. All right. Okay. All right, great. So I'm logged in as my user on the cluster. Uh, that's pretty small for everyone. Let me see yeah, if I can. Make it a bit bigger. No, it's good. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm now myself in Clifford at redhat.com, which is good. So now I want to go ahead and kick off a big training job. Uh, how would I go about do that, doing that? Um, well, do it like this. Um, so I'm in my notebook environment. I want to install all of the, or import all of the, the Codeflare SDK stuff that we need. Uh, you can authenticate as well. Um, it's basically what I just did uh, behind the scenes here. Uh, so you're correctly connected and have the correct permissions to the back end that, that you need. Um, and then we have where we like define our cluster. Um, so this is where it's kind of like the minimum set of parameters that we as a user would want to concern ourselves with as we define our distributed compute cluster. We can give it a name. We can sub tell it which namespace to go to. Um, what are the minimum and maximum number of workers that, we're, that we want to, to deploy? And then for each of those workers, what's their CPU memory um, and GPU? footprints look like. Uh, we also have the capacity for toggling on and off this thing that I mentioned during the talk a little bit, uh, which is InstaScale, which will actually go and resize your cluster um, given for these specific machine types um, if you have it enabled. But for sake of time and simplicity here, we're not gonna do that, show that feature in this demo here. Um, but cool, so we're gonna go ahead and do that. And that does a number of things, but the thing that might be most interesting is it kind of just it generates this YAML file for us. Um, so this is kind of the nitty gritty uh, DevOps stuff that we're trying to kind of obfuscate a little bit from the, the data scientist. Um, but if you know, it needs to be reviewed or seen, it's, it's there. And so once we have that, we're able to go ahead and actually um, just call cluster.up, and then it will go ahead and apply that YAML file to our, our cluster. Um, we can check the status and see that, yes, we have our active cluster available to us. Um, let's see, we can also check for cluster details. Um, again, the point here I hope you see is like, we're, trying to help the data scientists not have to go into the OpenShift console. Like this information is available to you if you have OpenShift readily available, but we're trying to kind of abstract that a little bit um, away. So yeah, so we can see that they've got their, their GPUs, their CPU, everything that they requested looks good. Um, also when we're using Ray, uh, Cube Ray, we get the benefit of this Ray dashboard It'll tell us some additional info about our, our worker nodes. Um, where was I just? Cool. So now that we know that our um, cluster is up and running and everything looks good, uh, we want to submit our job to it, right? So we want to be able to define a job object and ship it to one of the clusters that, that we have set up. Um, so we do this again by using just this, this job definition class give it a name, tell it which script um, it's gonna be running, and some like specific scheduler args because Ray here is the scheduler in this example. Uh, however, Ray is like not exclusively the only scheduler possible, so this gives you like flexibility to use some different um, arguments basically depending on the scheduler. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's running an mnist.py, which is obviously the uh, very basic piece of code. Um, but the point here that I want you all to notice is that it's just PyTorch. It's just like an off-the-shelf PyTorch example. There's no right here. There's no code flare. Um, 
it's, it's independent of all the stuff that we're kind of setting up around it. And hopefully the code ray stuff we're setting up around it is like pretty light. So it can kind of, you can easily translate your current work into, into taking advantage of what Codeflare uh, has to offer. Uh, cool, so we can take this job and then we're just gonna go ahead and submit it and we can check the status and see how oh, great it's running. Uh, cool, so let's assume that this is supposed to take five days and uh, I need to do something, I'm not gonna you know, not work for five days because <laughs> my model's training or whatever, so uh, what do I do? That's off on its own thing, doing its own thing. Um, I can come over to another notebook and I can start an interactive session with Ray and, and Codeflare. Um, so this is gonna look pretty similar um, up front. Um, so this is just a little bit more of an advanced workload, doing some transfer learning with, with Hugging Face. Um, but right up front, you know, it's the same stuff. We're just importing Codeflare, authenticating. Again, we have our, our cluster configuration. Um, in this particular case, you know, we might want to choose a vastly different footprint because we're just prototyping, trying to do some like small workloads to make sure things are, are working appropriately. And the thing to note is this, this has a different name, right? So this is a different uh, cluster that we're gonna be spinning up because obviously the other one is busy doing other work. So if you try to work with the one that's working, it won't work. <laughs> Basically, you'll be um, unable to, to get your, your workload in. So it's gonna generate a completely new uh, cluster for us. We run cluster.up. Um, yes, while it's spinning up, you get this result for uh, pending. Um, but just in full transparency, I've left these up running uh, during the demo. Um, so they're all good to go. And again, we can see that we have all the stuff that we need. Uh, where things are a little bit different here is in we're taking advantage of, of Ray's interactive capacity, um, is that we're actually going to uh, like initialize a session with Ray, um, but we've already like exposed the cluster URI and um, like encoded all of like the addresses and things that we need uh, into the notebook so that we can connect really easily to, to what we're doing. Yeah. Well, this is, so yeah, we basically do ray.init. We give it the ray cluster URI that we, we've set up through our uh, YAML file. Uh, we also give it a runtimes environment where it can actually patch the existing nodes that it's working with to install certain uh, packages that it might need. Um, this basically like prevents us from needing to like rebuild images and push them to Quay before we're able to experiment. So it's a pretty uh, convenient feature. Um, cool, and then we just like to like make sure things are, are actually working. Uh, so we're gonna run this piece of code. Uh, it's raid.remote. Um, that is, we can see that it divided the work essentially about evenly between the different uh, Ray, Ray nodes. Um, not sure what that warning's about, but I'm sure it's fine. Uh, cool, so yeah, so that's, you can see the three Ray nodes there, and they distribute this thousand job, thousand item job about equally. Uh, cool, so we know everything's working. We can then go ahead and deploy our like distill BERT uh, IMDB fine-tuned job, which again here, this is maybe using a little bit more uh, Ray-specific stuff, but it's still part of like the, the integration with Ray and Hugging Face and, and PyTorch. Um, that would be pretty straightforward anyways. Um, and then we can go ahead and deploy that. Hopefully nothing weird happens here. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, so it found the cached data because I ran this earlier and it's gonna start to run the job. Cool, so now that's running um, and just from experience, I know that's gonna take quite a while and we can go back to our uh, 
long-running batch job, and we can see that it actually succeeded, and we got success while we were doing that other stuff. Uh, cool, so that's pretty much the demo that I wanted to share with everyone. Um, I just... Oops. Pull up the last slide, and we can take any questions if there's time. Thank you. Management and deployment tool for AI machine learning, and what's the difference between it and Airflow? <laughs> um, Where should I use which one? Uh, yeah, so I think so. The, I think the point of what we're trying to get to is like the distributed part of it. So Airflow is for like pipelining, basically, right? So you would like annotate your code in order to string it into like a pipeline. Whereas this is about distributing the work across like multiple nodes. So maybe I mis don't fully understand Airflow, but I think the, that's the difference is this is about distributing work and Airflow is about pipelining work, right? Thanks. Does that make sense? I'm not that familiar with Airflow. Right. So I'm wondering if it's <laughs> Okay, yeah. Yeah, there's a question in the back. Thank you for our presentation. Uh, do you have any benchmarks uh, to showcase how much faster this um, distribution makes the monitoring and deployments? Uh, we don't have any benchmarks here, and I mean, it's simply because, I mean, it, like it's, maybe it, it's right? distributed. I mean, it's, it's, it, it is definitely distributed versus single threaded, so it's almost certainly gonna be somewhat faster. Yeah, I mean, like, I ran into uh, situations where we had to you know, make some things happen to uh, <clears throat> not run our models for days, right? And uh, there's different ways to do that, so I was wondering if this would be the next way when we run into some problem. From a baseline perspective, like, is it faster than doing some other ways? Yeah, I mean, there's always like the, whatever, management overhead associated with having these like schedulers and having Ray kind of in the middle doing stuff. But I think, and yeah, maybe two GPUs is not gonna get a huge performance, but scaling it up to like many, many more, it will be faster. Um, but no benchmarks yet, but great question, thanks. Oh, sorry. Um, so that was just kind of like an example piece of code. So do you, are you familiar with the company Hugging Face? No, I might go back in. I don't do. Okay, no, that's fine. <laughs> so yeah, so Hugging Face is the name of like a, a company basically that they do a, kind of a lot of stuff, I think, but they one of their services that they offer um, kind of like pre-trained models for people to use, so like large-scale pre-trained models. And so they have a, a model called Dis Distilbert, which is a language model. And the example there was we were saying, okay, I want to uh, take the pre-trained Distilbert model and then essentially retrain it with a smaller data set from IMDB such that it will like more, more better generate uh, uh, generate like IMDB-like content. Yeah, they, uh, hug, hu Hugging Face, like, you know, they specialize, uh, as Michael said, in language models, so they're good at things like sentiment analysis. Um, you may all have heard, you know, the news these days with chat GPT. Um, you know, they also make a bunch of models like that, for language models, so that, that's kind of like their specialty.
Cool. Well, if there aren't any other questions, thank you all for staying a little bit after. Thanks for coming to our talk.